Well, welcome everyone. It is time for us to uh, start our weekly Sabbath service. We're here on this, uh, this ninth day of the first month. I want to thank you all for joining us and uh, like to start services by asking James Daly if he would uh, please open in prayer. If you'll please stand for the opening prayer, we'll turn the mic over to James. Over to you, James. Yes, thank you. Our Father, Abba, Yehovah, we all have been in a war for this past close to 40 jubilees, soon be coming to a close. As these end of days approach and the end of this time will signal the return of your son and to prepare the planet to recover from the 40 jubilees of assaults has been put to in an attempt to destroy your work. We ask to be able to play a part to correctly protect your creation, the works of your hands, and all that you're doing. So we give you thanks. Throughout this period, mankind has has been an ongoing attempt to control their, their thoughts. We've ended up being mind controlled through the frequencies that are beamed into every part of Earth and uh, amongst us in the West through the frequencies that are in our homes that uh, destroy even our fertility, our ability to think clearly. It's being done for behavior modification that will make man unable to discern truth. We can see this with the people that we've known all our lives have had a change of mind and have difficulty communicating with them. We'd ask you to please keep our minds clear so that we can have the ability to remain correctly aligned with you and your words. If you please protect us from the assaults we're under, but especially protect us from ourselves and help us focus correctly and follow your way and your way alone. We'd ask that you please give Donald Trump the ability to take back the social media from those who stole the patents, and then have weaponized them against us all in an ongoing war. Give us, uh, please strengthen our ability to discern the effects of giving our minds to the control of machines which can recognize us by our vibrations. Please protect Donald Trump, who's stopping the blood drinking pedivores who are murdering your children. Please give him people who can help him stop these activities and the machine sub-thinking so that all will convert and follow your thinking and your ways, which alone can have us pay a part in preventing the destruction of all that you've made. Please forgive us all the, the part that we may have played in this and uh, give us the ability to communicate better with people that you have called. Perhaps we'll choose so that we can all be better ambassadors to those we speak with. Help us to communicate without fear. And, uh, 
please. We give you the greatest thanks and praise for all that you've done. And uh, praise and honor to you, our Father. Amen. Okay, amen to that. Thank you, James. If, uh, if you'll all please remain standing and take up your hymnals and open them up to page 11. On page 11 of your hymnal, we'll sing our opening hymn, which comes from Psalm 11 titled, His Eyes Behold. After, uh, sorry, um, His Eyes Behold, uh, page 11, comes from Psalm 11 to open our song service. Okay, that is a beautiful hymn. His eyes behold the children of men. You know, there's nothing we can do to hide from our Creator. You know, we might be able to hide from each other and uh, fool each other, and we might even be able to fool ourselves to a certain extent, but we can't hide from God or fool Him, that's for sure. And we will all at some point be held accountable for everything we do, everything we say, even our thoughts. Okay, now if you'll turn over to page 25, we'll sing our second hymn, which comes from Psalm 32, titled, They Are Blessed Who Are Forgiven, and that's something we're very thankful for, the fact that we can be forgiven, because we, at least I'm speaking for myself, make plenty of mistakes. So uh, if you will uh, um, turn over to page 25, we'll sing our second hymn, They Are Blessed Who Are Forgiven, after which we'll turn the mic over to Wes to bring us the weekly news update. Page 25, They Are Blessed Who Are Forgiven.
So, if you'll please stand, we will now have our third hymn, which can be found on page 32, and it's titled, For It Is Yah Who Orders Life, and this comes from Psalm 39, after which we'll bring Wes back to the mic to read in the book of Exodus, chapters 37 through 40, and this will conclude um, the book of Exodus. So first we'll sing page 32, For it is Yah who orders life, after which Wes will read in the book of Exodus, chapters 37 through 40. Okay, if you will please be seated, we'll now turn the mic back over to Wes to read in the book of Exodus, chapters 37 through 40. Wes, back over to you. Thank you, Dave. Starts out, it says the ark. Bezel made the ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. He overlaid it with pure gold, both inside and out, and made a gold molding around it. He cast four golden rings for it and fastened them to its four feet with two rings on each side, two rings on the other. Then he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with pure gold. And he inserted the poles into the rings on the side of the ark to carry it. He made the atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cube and a half wide. Then he made two cubits out of hammered gold at the end of the cover. He made one cubit on one end and the second on the other. At the two ends, he made them of one piece with the cover, the, the cherubim had their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim faced each other, looking toward the cover. 
the table on verse 10. They made the table of acacia wood, two cubins long, a cubin wide, and a cubin and a half high. Then they overlaid it with pure gold and made the gold mounting around it. They also made around it a rim of hand breeded wide and put a gold molding on the rim. They cast four gold rings for the table and fastened them to the corners where the four legs were. And the rings were put close to the rim to hold the poles used in carrying the table. The poles for the carrying of the table were made of acacia wood and overlaid with pure gold. And they made pure gold the article for the table. Its plates, its ladens, ladles, and bowls, and its pitchers for the pouring out of drink offerings. Verse 17, the lampstand. They made the lampstand of pure gold and hammered it out, base and shaft. It flowered like cups, buds, and blooms were on one piece with it. Six branches extended from the side of the lampstand, three on one bud and blossoms were on one branch, three for the next branch, and the same for the all six branches extending from the lampstand. And on the lampstand were four cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. One bud was under the first pair of branches extending from the lampstand, a second bud under the second pair. The third bud never, I'm sorry, on the third bud under the third pair, six branches and all, the bud and the branches were all of one piece with the lampstand hammered out of pure gold. They made it seven lamps as well as its wicks trimmed and trays of pure gold. They made the lampstand and all of its accessories for one talent of pure gold, the altar of incense. Verse 25, they made the altar of incense out of acacia wood. It was square, a cuban long, a cuban wide, and two cubans high. Its horn of one piece with its with it, they overlaid the top and all the sides and the horn with pure gold and made it gold mounting around it. They made two golden rings below the molding and two on opposite sides to hold the poles used to carry it. They made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. They also made the sacred, sacred anointing oil and the pure fragrant incense the wood of, of a perfume. The altar of burnt offerings, verse chapter 38. They built the altar of burnt offerings of acacia wood, three cubins high. It was square, five cubins long and five cubins wide. They made a horn at each of the corners, four corners as that the horn and the altars were of one piece and they overlaid it all with pure with altar with bronze they made all its utensils of bronze its pots its shovels its sprinkling bowls meat forks and fire pans they made gating for the altar a bronze network so be under its ledger halfway up the altar. They cast bronze rings to hold the poles for the four corners of the bronze. They inserted the poles into the rings so they could be on the side of the altar to carry it. They made it hollow out of boards. Let me get down here. Wow. A lot here to read 38. They made the bronze brazen and its bronze stand from the mirror of the woman who served 
at the entrance to the tent of meetings, the courtyard. Next, they made the courtyard. The south side was a hundred cubans long and had curtains of finely twisted linen with 20 posts and 12 bronze bases and with 12 and silver hooks and bands on the poles. The north side also a hundred cubans long and had 20 pots and 20 bronze basins with silver hooks and bands on the pots. The west end was 50 cubans wide and had curtains with 10 poles and 10 basins with silver hooks and bands on the post. The east end toward the sunrise was also 50 cubans wide, posts and three basins and curtains 15 cubans long were on the other side of the entrance to the courtyard with three pots and three late basins. All the court curtains around the courtyard were of finely twisted linen. The basin for the pots and for, were bronze. The hooks and bands on the poles were silver and their pots tops were overlaid with silver. So all the posts and the courtyard had silver bands. The curtain for the entrance to the courtyard was a blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, a finely twisted linen. The works of an embroiderer, it was 20 curtains long. I'm sorry, 20 cubits long. And like the curtains of the courtyard, five cubits high, with four posts and four brown basins. Their hooks and basins were silver and their tops were overlaid with silver and all the tent pegs of the tabernacle were of surrounding the courtyard were bronze. Material used, verse 21. These are the amount of materials used for the tabernacle, tab uh, tabernacle of the testimony which were recorded at Moses' command by the Levites under the direction of Ithamar, son of Aaron. The priest, Bezel, son of Uri, Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made everything the Lord commanded Moses, and with him was Oled, son of Ashamech, of the tribe of uh, Dan, a craftsman and designer, an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet, yarn and fine linen. The total amount of gold from the weight wave offering used for all the works of the sanctuary was 29 talents of talents and 730 shekels, according to the sanctuary shekels. The silver silver obtained from those of the community who had counted in the and since it was 100 talents and 1,775 shekels, according to the sanctuary section, one beka per person. That is half a shekel, according to the sanctuary shekel, for everyone who had cr cr crossed over to those counted 20 years old or more than upward was 603,000. 550 men. The 100 talents of silver was used to cast the basins of the sanctuary and for the curtains, 100 basins from the talents, one talent for each basin. They used the 1,775 shekels to make the hooks from the post and overlaid the top of the post and to make their bands. The bronze from the wave offering was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. They used it to make the basins for the entrance to the tent of meetings. The bronze altar with its bronze gatings and all its utensils, the basin for the surrounding courtyard and for those of the entrance and all the tent pegs from the tabernacle to those for the surrounding courtyard. 
the priestly garments, chap, verse, chapter 39. From the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, they made woven garments from ministering in the sanctuary. They also made sacred garments for Aaron, as the Lord commanded Moses, the ephods. They made the ephods of gold and blue and purple and scarlet and of finely twisted linen. They hammered out the thin sheets of gold and cut strands to be worked into the blue, the purple, and the scarlet yarn and fine linen, the works of a skillful craftsman. They made shoulder pieces for the enrod, which were attached to the two of its corners so it could be fastened. Its skillfully woven waistband was like it, one one piece with the enrod and made with gold and the blue and the purple and the scarlet yarn and with finely twisted linen as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 6. They mounted the onyx stones in gold filigrees, filigrees <coughs> settings and engraved them like a seal with the name of the son of Israel. Then they fastened them on the shoulder pieces of the Enrons as memorial stones for the stone of Israel as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 8, the breastplates they fastened the breastplates, the works of a skillful craftsman. They made it like the enrons of gold and blue and purple and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen. It was square, a span long and a span wide and folded double. Then they mounted four rows of precious stones on it. In the front, first row there <clears throat> was ruby, topaz, burly, in the second row was, oh boy, turquoise, sapphire, and emerald. In the third row, jackson, and a gator, and amethyst. In the fourth row was chrysolite, oxen, and jasper. They were mounted in gold, filigree settings. They were 12 stones, one for each of the names of the sons of Israel, each engraved like a seal with the name of one of the 12 tribes. For the breastplates they made, <clears throat> brides chains of pure gold, like a robe. They made two gold filigree settings and two gold rings and fastened the rings to two of the corners of the breastplate. They fastened the two golden chains to the rings of the corners of the breastplates and, and the other end of the chain to the two settings attaching them to the shoulder pieces of the ephod at the front. They made two golden rings and attached them to the other corners of the breastplate on the inside edge next to the ephod. Then they made two more gold rings and attached them to the bottom of the shoulder pieces on the front of the enrod, close to the seams just above the waistband of the enrods. They tied the rings and the breastplates to the rings of the ephods with blue cords connecting it to the waistband so that the breastplate would not swing out from the ephod as the Lord commanded Moses. Other priestly garments, verse 22. They made the robes of the emeralds entirely of blue cloth. The work of a weaver with an opening in the corner of the robe like the opening of a collar and a band around its opening so that it would not tear. They made pomegranate of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen around the hem of the robe. And they made bells of pure gold 
and attacks them around the hem between the pomegranates. The bells and the pomegranates alerted, alternated, I'm sorry, around the hem of the robe to be worn for ministering as the Lord commanded Moses. For Aaron and his sons, they made tunics of fine linen, the works of weavers, and the tunic tur turbans of fine linen, and the linen headbands, and the undergarments, and, fil and, fil and of finely twisted linen. The sash <clears throat> was of finely twisted linen and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, the works of an embroiderer as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the plates and the sacred diadems out of pure gold engraved in it, like an ins inscription on a seal, holy to the Lord. Then they fastened a blue cord to it to attach it to the turban, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 32, Moses inspects the tabernacle. So all the works of the tabernacle, the tent of meetings, and completed in Israelite did everything just as the Lord had commanded. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses and the tent and all the finished furnishings. Clamps, the frames, the crossbars, the posts, the bases, the covering, the ram skin, dyed red, the covering of hides of sea cows, and the shielding curtains, the ark of the testimony with its poles and atonement coverings, the tabernacle with its articles and the, the and the bread of the presence, the pure gold lampstands with its rows of lamps and all the accessories and all the oil and the light and the gold altar, the anointing oil and the fragrant incense and the curtains and the entrance to the tent, the bronze altar and its bronze gathering and the poles and all its utensils, the basin with its stands and the curtains and its courtyard with its posts and basin and curtains for the entrance to the courtyard, the ropes and ten pegs for the courtyard and all the furnishings of the tabernacle, the tent of meetings and the woven garments worn by ministers in the sanctuary, both the sacrifice garments of for Aaron for the priest and the garments for his sons were serving as priests. The Israelites had done all the works as the Lord had commanded Moses, and Moses inspected the works and saw that they had done it just as the Lord had commanded, so Moses blessed them. Setting up of the tabernacle. Verse 40, is that it? Yeah, you want me to do that, okay. Then the Lord said to Moses, set up the tabernacle, the tent of meetings. On the first day of the first month, place the articles of the testimony in it and shield the ark with the curtains. Bring in the table and the settings on out belong to it. Then bring in the lampstand to set them up in lamp places. The golden altar and the incense in front of the ark of the testimony and put the curtains at the entrance to the tabernacle. Place the altar, the burnt offerings in front and the entrance to the tabernacle and the tent of meetings and the place the bases between the tent and the meetings and the altar and putting water in it. Set up the courtyard around it. Put the curtains at the entrance to the courtyard. Take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and everything in it. Consecrate it, all its furnishings, and it will be holy. Then anoint the altar, a burnt offering, and all its utensils. Consecrate the altar, and it will be most holy. Anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate them. Bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance to the tent of meetings and wash them with water. Then dress Aaron in the sacred garments, anoint him and consecrate him so he may serve me as priest. Bring his sons and dress them in tunics. Anoint them just as you anoint their fathers so that they may serve me as priest. Their anointing will be to priesthood that will continue for all generations to come. Bless Moses, everything just as the Lord commanded him, so that the tabernacle was set up on the first day of the first month in the second year. 
when Moses set up the tabernacle, he put the bases in place, erected the frames, inserted the crossbars, and set up the post. Then he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering over the tent as the Lord had commanded him. He took the testimony and placed it in the ark, attached the poles to the ark, and put the atonement covered it over it. Then he brought the ark into the tabernacle and hung the shield curtains and shielded the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded him. Moses placed the table in the tent of meetings on the north side of the tabernacle outside the curtains and set out bread on it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded. He placed the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle and set it up the lampstand before the Lord as the Lord had commanded him. Moses placed the golden altar and the tent of meetings in front of the curtains and burnt fragment, fragrant incense on it as the Lord had commanded him. He then put the curtains of it at the entrance to the tabernacle. He set the altar of burnt offerings at the entrance to the tabernacle. The tent of meetings and offered on it burnt offerings and grain offerings as the Lord commanded him. He placed the basin between the tent of meetings and the altar and put water in, in it for watering. And Moses and Aaron and his sons used it to wash their hands and their feet. They washed whenever they entered the tent of meetings or approached the altar as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and the altar and put the curtains at the entrance to the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. The glory of the Lord, verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meetings and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meetings because the cloud had settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the house of Israel during all their travels. Wow. Back at you, Dave. Well, thank you, Wes. Well, that concludes our, uh, our reading of Exodus. It's interesting to note that uh, another key event that took place on the first day of the first month um, is the, uh, the um, setting up of the tabernacle. So uh, I thought that was interesting. Okay, so if you'll please stand one more time, take up your hymnals, and turn to page 55. Uh, we'll sing a hymn which uh, comes from Psalm 72, and this is something that we should be praying for on a regular basis, uh, for God to give proper and righteous judgment to our leaders and not only within the church but our national leadership and and as well um, the hymn on page 55 titled give judgment to the king O Yah." after which i'll be back with the main message which is a review of the sequence of events for this passover season in 2019 but first, we'll sing page 55, Give Judgment to the King, O Yah.
Okay, if you'll please be seated. We'll now uh, have our main message, which, uh, as I said, is the um, sequence for the Lord's Supper and Passover for 2019. Um, I... Uh, I want to share, let's see, give me one second. Yeah, I want to share this presentation I have. Hopefully you can all see that. If you wouldn't mind letting me know if you can see that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this uh, this Passover sequence for 2019, we know that Yahushua the Messiah, or as he's more... Uh, commonly known Jesus, who is the Christ, is the acceptable sacrifice which enables all of us to be passed over. And, and we'll, we'll be talking a little bit about this concept of Passover and, and the meaning of Pesach uh, during the Feast of Passover. Um, I think that's uh, something we should understand more fully. And everyone is commanded, all of the baptized individuals who have received um, cleansing through baptism and receipt of the Holy Spirit are commanded to observe the Lord's Supper as a requirement to enter into the kingdom of God. You can see that in John 6, 52 through 58. And we're going to, or will be preparing for um, the sanctification of ourselves as part of the temple of God, which is the body of Christ. And you can see that in John 2.21 and 1 Corinthians 12.27 and also in Colossians 1.24. And we should all be observing this ordinance correctly as living sacrifices, as we see in Romans 12, 1, 1 Peter 2, 5, and Hebrews 13, 16. And we will begin this sequence on the first day of the first month, which is in the new moon of the new year, which we observed. And you can see that in Exodus 12, 2, and Psalm 80, verses 1 through 3 which occurs on one Abib, which is the name given to the first month. And it is a high holy day, right? It's a feast day. It's, it's a new moon. Isaiah 66, 23, Psalm 81, 3, 2 Chronicles 29, 17, Ezekiel 46, 1 through 4, and Amos 8, 5. So you can... You can see in those verses the fact that it is a, a, a holy day and the temple was opened up. So this new year uh, with the correct New Year's Day of the sacred calendar, which as I said is a holy day, commences on the first day of the first month. This begins with the lunar solar conjunction at around 10.50 a.m. International Standard Time on Friday, April 5th. The end of evening nautical twilight, or EENT, or dark, is at around 6.51 p.m. in Jerusalem, making it April 5th, 2019, would be a New Year's Day. And we kept New Year's Day on Friday, April 5th, um, and I wanted to apologize for being late in delivering this message. I should have delivered this a month ago. Um, and uh, I really have no, no, uh, no excuse, I guess. I, I just 
failed to get it done and for that I apologize and we'll, we've resolved to make sure that this occurs early enough uh, going forward so that everybody can properly understand the sequence, especially those who are new may not understand the, the sequence of, of the Passover events. So it's important that we cover this early enough so that everybody can prepare uh, properly. Uh, the time of the conjunction at Jerusalem sets the day apart as a holy day. Since, as I said, this is the first day of the first month of the new year. And we've seen, you know, that Noah came out of the ark. The tabernacle was erected on the first day of the first month. So this day has uh, significance in scripture. And it is a, a new moon, which is set aside as a holy day. The vernal equinox is was uh, on uh, March 20th at 11.58 p.m. International Standard Time. And this year of the Roman year 2019 is the 42nd year of the 120th Jubilee. And this is the 40th Jubilee since the baptism of Messiah in 27 CE. And this happens to be the seventh year of the seven year cycle, the Sabbath year. So uh, tithes are are suspended for um, this year, being the Sabbath year. There is no tithe. And 40, right, uh, referring back to being the 40th Jubilee, is a, a period granted for repentance. In Deuteronomy 8.2, it says, And you shall remember the whole way of that Yehovah, your Elohim, has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And you can see also Deuteronomy 29, 5 and 6 and Numbers 14, 33 through 34. And you can see this over and over again, this reference back to keeping the commandments of God. The law of God is not something that we can just diminish or throw away at will or uh, claim that it's, it's uh, no longer applicable because we have grace, etc. Man does not have the authority to nullify the law of God and replace it with something of his own making. The planet will have received 40 jubilees for its repentance and its grant will conclude in the Roman years of Atonement 2027 or from Atonement 2027 to Atonement 2028. Uh, that's based on our reckoning and understanding of the calendar, at least at this point in time. Now what we're going to cover today is the necessary inclusive sequence in our preparation for the 21 days of sanctification, which starts at the new moon of the new year, which include the fast, the Lord's Supper, the Passover meal, the wave sheaf offering, and the days of unleavened bread. Now this feast of Passover is to be kept for eight days. From Deuteronomy 16, 4 through 7, which says, No leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory for seven days, nor shall any of the flesh that you sacrifice on the evening of the first day remain all night until morning. You may not offer the Passover sacrifice with any, uh, within any of your towns that Yehovah your Elohim is giving you, but at the place that Yehovah your Elohim will choose to make his name dwell in it. There you shall offer the Passover sacrifice in the evening at sunset at the time you came out of Egypt, and you shall cook it and eat it at the place that Yehovah your Elohim will choose, and in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. Uh, so this is a, one of the annual, the three annual pilgrimage feasts where we go and, and uh, stay in temporary accommodation and keep the feast as we're commanded.
And Jesus and his family kept the complete feast for the full number of days at the assigned location in Jerusalem. And you can see that in Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 43. And where it says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. So they were there for the entire feast. And we also observe um, the eight full days at our designated sites, just as the disciples did. And you can see that in Luke 24, 13 through 33, where it says, That very day two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all the th these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they, they, when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Right? So all of this stuff was prophesied. God does nothing unless he reveals it to his people first. Right? In verse 26, Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? See, they, they were mistakenly looking for a king messiah instead of a priest messiah. Verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. And they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while we talked on, uh, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together. So attendance uh, for the eight-day feast in, in this first uh, feast of the year is not a burden, and we should never consider it a burden. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to understand the significance of these feasts to understand the fact that we are called out of this world to follow our Creator. That's not a burden, that's a privilege. In 1 John 5, 3, it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Now, this society tries to make it burdensome, 
And we sometimes can feel burdened because we fear what man can do. Or we stress over all of the things that seem to happen around Passover time. But keeping these commandments is not a burden. It's a blessing. And it just so happens that God bears our burdens from Psalm 68, 19. Blessed be Adonai, who daily bears us up. Elohim is our salvation. Selah. And in turn, we shouldn't create more burden for him with our sins. In Isaiah 43, 21 through 25, it says, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise, yet you did not call upon me, O Jacob, but you have been weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with frankincense. You have not brought to me or bought me sweet cane with money or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. But you have burdened me with your sins. You have worried me with your iniquities. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. I don't know if anyone out there has had a wayward child, but they can cause great stress for parents. And that's how... Our Father views us when we don't obey what he told us to do. We become wayward children. And we become a pain in the neck to our Father and our Creator in heaven. And our improper keeping of the feasts, and these feasts are not our feasts, these are Yehovah's feasts, our Father's feasts, and it is a great offense to him. If we don't keep these feasts properly, it's an offense. In Isaiah 1, 8 through 20, it says, And the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard. Right? These booths and vineyards were places where caretakers would stay uh, to watch over the vineyard and, and keep pests and, and things that might... Uh, you know, do harm to the vineyard, away. Uh, left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If Yehovah of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of Yehovah, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our Elohim, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says Yehovah? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. Is that what God really wants from us? No. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Notice he's not, he's not condemning the new moon, the Sabbath, or the calling of convocations. He's condemning the iniquity that is involved in some, the way they were doing it. Verse 14, your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Right? We're where we wear our father out by continually disappointing him. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Clean. Remove the evil of your deeds. Sorry. Um, learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. 
Come now, let us reason together, says Yehobah. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, or two things, willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse, so if you're not willing, and you rebel, don't obey, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of Yehovah has spoken. Brethren, we have to obey the terms of the covenant, which is that contract that we entered into at baptism. Right? If we don't obey the terms of that covenant, our relationship with our Father is hindered. And if you're considering baptism, you need to be mindful of the fact that when you enter into that contract, you're held accountable for the terms of that contract and obeying the terms of the contract. Baptism is a serious thing. And, and we need to be mindful and thoughtful uh, when entering into that contract. Proverbs 28, 9 says, If one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. All of these people out there that are praying to God and saying that the law is done away, it doesn't apply, they don't keep the Sabbath, they don't keep the Holy Days, they don't, they don't observe the covenant. Their prayers are an abomination. We prepare ourselves to, and attend the Lord's Supper to be rewashed and re-cleansed. This is so that we may keep ourselves from the sins and the iniquities of, of Egypt, right? And we live in modern-day Egypt, wherever we are. You know, it's, it, there, all of these places are fairly close to the same. Some are a little more debased than others, but you get the, the, the point I'm trying to make here. These iniquities come from following man's legal systems as opposed to the law of God and refusing to acknowledge the supremacy of God the Father. We fear what man can do to us, but we don't properly fear God. And in fact, you know, most, I shouldn't say most, uh, a good portion of our society refuses to even acknowledge that he exists. And there's an example of this replacing of God's law with man's law. In Exodus, when Moses instituted the Sabbath for the captive Israelites and Pharaoh made them work that day. Exodus 5.5 5, says, And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. Right? So he wasn't happy. So this iniquity is a type of this present modern world system or world order, which will generate its penalties for the faithful and the faithless. Right? So... I guess reward is a better term than penalties because the faithful will get their reward and so will the faithless. In Revelation 11, 1 through 9, it says, Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky, 
that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in the tomb. This ability for the world to view these events is certainly available these days with the internet and satellites and even, you know, in some of the more primitive areas of the world. Every year, we should have our understanding of the plan of Yehovah's reconciliation improving. If we're, if we're dedicated to doing what our Father tells us, He continues to open our minds to further understanding His mind. You know, like David said, so much higher are your thoughts than my thoughts. Our goal is to have the mind of God. And that should be occurring, uh, you know, every year we should be getting more spiritually mature with better understanding. And this is a re direct result of obedience to God's instruction regarding the observance of all his holy days. In Acts 5.32 it says, And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Right? He gave it to those who obey him. Tell me the law doesn't apply. If the law doesn't apply, what exactly are we obeying? So from the first day of the month, which is a new, uh, new moon holy day, until the 21st day inclusive, we should be in prayer daily, uh, fasting, uh, for, uh, for the salvation of our brethren, for ourselves, for the fallen host of mankind. We should be praying for the reconciliation of the planet. So the first day of the first month is fr was Friday, April 5th. Again, I'm, I'm late in this presentation and I apologize for that. But, uh, so it was on April 5th, Friday, and this is the first day of the first month, uh, and of course a new moon, and a holy day of worship, as are all the new moons. In Isaiah 66, 3, it says, He who slaughters an ox is like one who kills a man, he who sacrifices a lamb like one who breaks a dog's neck, he who presents a grain offering like one who offers pig's blood, he who makes, and that's an abomination, he who makes a memorial offering of frankincense, like one who blesses an idol. These have chosen their own ways, and their soul delights in their abominations. Ezekiel 46, 1 through 3, says, Thus says Adonai Yahovi, The gate of the inner court that faces east shall be shut on the sixth working days, but on the Sabbath day it shall be open, and on the day of the new moon it shall be open. The prince shall enter by the vestibule of the gate from outside, and shall take his stand by the post of the gate. The priests shall offer his burnt offering and his peace offerings, and he shall worship at the threshold of the gate. Then he shall go out, but the gate shall not be shut until evening. The people of the land shall bow down at the entrance of that gate before Yehovah on the Sabbaths and on the new moons. So, evidence right here that the new moon is considered equal to the Sabbath, at least, as the, the events in the temple at that time uh, were, the temple was opened up on the new moon and the Sabbath. Colossians 2.16, 
says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Meaning, don't let anyone discourage you from keeping these days. Don't anyone, you know, don't let anyone condemn you for keeping these days. And better yet, keep these days properly so that they can't look at you and say, you know, something negative. And you, as a result, bring shame on the name of God. When you walk around saying that you are, are a follower of God, and then you make a mockery of his law and his days, uh, well, you are bringing shame on his name, and you're taking his name in vain. You have taken the name of Yehovah. When you become baptized, you say, I am Yehovah's slave. I am his servant. Right? I belong to Yehovah, holy to Yehovah, as Wes read earlier. So if you don't honor that, you take his name in vain. So this is the seventh uh, or sabbatical year in the Septuagint, which is a seven-year cycle. And this begins with the cleansing of you and I and all of us as the spiritual temple. This is from the first day in preparation for the sanctification of the elect on the seventh day. In 2 Chronicles 29, 16 through 18, it says, The priest went into the inner parts of the house of Yehovah to cleanse it. And they brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of Yehovah into the court of the house of Yehovah. And the Levites took it and carried it out to the brook Kidron, they began to consecrate on the first day of the first month, and on the eighth day of the month, they came to the vestibule of the Lord, of Yehovah. Then for eight days they consecrated the house of Yehovah, and on the sixteenth day of the first month they finished. Right, notice that, the sixteenth day they finished cleansing the temple. Then they went in to Hezekiah, the king, and said, We have cleansed all of the house of Yehovah, the altar of the burnt, of burnt offering, and all its utensils, and the table for the showbread, and all its utensils. And over in Mark 11, 15 through 18, it says, And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers, and the seats of those who sold pigeons, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, it is, uh, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. Now, most important is our individual preparation for the annual memorial Passover sequence. This is a time when we interact with our Father and we are, are tending to that relationship. We are taking a, an introspective look at ourselves, an honest evaluation of how we stack up to the expectations. And we have to include that in our preparation. We have to take stock in our shortcomings and, and resolve to overcome it this coming year. This is part of our active cleansing of the temple. 1 Corinthians 11, 25 through 31. It says, in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread 
and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Notice there's no mention of his birth. See, Satan's system has flipped everything on its end. So the bulk of humanity on this planet celebrate Christmas as Jesus' birth, which he wasn't born in December. We all know that that's of pagan origins and based on the Saturnalia, etc. But we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. Now, most people look at discerning the body as figuring out what organization most closely fits your beliefs and associating with that organization and keeping the, the days with that church or organization. But we have to examine our own bodies. This self uh, evaluation that has to take place because he says but if we judged ourselves truly if we took an honest look at ourselves in the mirror we wouldn't have to be judged because we would be our own worst critic and we would be taking steps necessary to overcome now this event has to be kept in a temporary accommodation Deuteronomy 16 5 through 7 you may not offer the Passover sacrifice within any of your towns that Yehovah your Elohim is giving you, but at the place that Yehovah your Elohim will choose. Right? We read all of that earlier. And you're going to, um, you know, it says there you shall offer the Passover sacrifice in the evening at sunset at the time you came out of Egypt, and you shall cook it and eat it at the place that Yehovah your Elohim will choose. And in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. And it's my understanding that go to your tents means back to your temporary dwelling. Matthew 26, 17 through 19. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. So this is held in temporary accommodations. So now um, we move on to the, the seventh day of the month, is of this first month, is a fast for sanctification. And this takes place on... Wednesday, April 10th. So it starts on the dark on April 10th and, and ends at dark on April 11th. And, and that's when we should have been fasting uh, for the uh, error and ignorance. Our own errors and our own ignorance and those of our brethren and those of everyone around. Ezekiel 45, 18 through 20. Thus says Adonai Yehovi, In the first month, on the first day of the month, you shall take a bull from the herd without blemish and purify the sanctuary. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering and put it on the doorposts of the temple, the four corners of the ledge of the altar, and the posts of the gate of the inner court. You shall do the same on the seventh day of the month for anyone who has sinned through error or ignorance. So you shall make atonement for the temple. And there are lots of sins committed in error and ignorance. Every second of every day. Mark eleven twelve says, 
On the following day, when they came to Bethany, he was hungry. And this could very well be a reference back to the fact that he was keeping that fast for the sanctification of the of the uh, the er, those that commit sin in error and ignorance. So, as I said, the fast begins on Wednesday, April tenth, and ends on. Thursday, April 11th, at dark. Days begin at dark, or E-E-N-T, which is our the standard for dark. And there's a, you can see the paper start of the day on our website for more information about when the day starts and ends. But just real quick, you know, in Genesis 1-5, it says, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day, right? So evening came before morning in that particular reference anyway. And then in Acts 27, 27 through 33, it says, When the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land, so they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. A little farther, uh, a little farther on, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense without food, having taken nothing. So it was the 14th day from the night until the day portion. So it was still the 14th. And it began right in verse 27 with the 14th night had come and then the 14th day. So the night before day. So your local time um, of dark or E-E-N-T uh, you have to you have to find out when that is, and there are places you can look that up. Um, and I will post this is this is an abridged version of the full Passover sequence paper. Uh, that paper will be posted on the website, and it has information on there or in there about where you can find more information on when E E N T is in your local areas. Um, they have apps you can, on your phone. I have an app on my phone that wherever I am, I can calculate my position, my location, and it'll tell me what time EENT is in that location. So technology, you know, does have some good uses. So by the time we've gotten this far into the sequence, right? We should be praying for forgiveness for our sins, for the error and ignorance in the body of Christ, in the churches of God, in the assemblies of Eloah, for our individual families and tribes, and for the whole planet's reconciliation to our Father. All baptized individuals should be participating in this fast. If, of course, you know, there are no medical reasons uh, to preclude them from keeping it. In Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through eight, 18, sorry, it says, Yet even now, declares Yehovah, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to Yehovah your Elohim, for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, 
and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not return and relent, or turn and relent, and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for Yehovah your Elohim. Below, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests and the ministers of Yehovah weep and say, Spare your people, O Yehovah, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Then Yehovah became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. So this fasting is part of the responsibility that we have to assist our bridegroom, Jesus the, the Messiah, in cleansing the house in preparation for the part we have in the upcoming marriage supper. Now, we can't sanctify anything, right? So the most we can do is humble ourselves in fasting and prayer for the forgiveness of our sins and error and ignorance. That's the most we can do to sanctify anything. We ask God to sanctify them. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9 says, Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. All right? We have to make ourselves ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Christ's blood sanctifies, we know. In Hebrews 13, 12, it says, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. The truth also sanctifies. In John 17, 17, it says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So we fast as our part in the atonement and reconciliation process. Joel 1, verse 14. Joel chapter 1, verse 14 says, Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of Yehovah your Elohim, and cry out to Yehovah. You know, many great things have been done through fasting. Look at Esther. Israel was saved by her actions and calling a fast. This fast is on behalf of the error and ignorance of the negligent and deceived congregation. From Joel 2, 10 through 27. And for the future day of the Lord. We also assist our future husband. And yes, the men... Christ is our husband when he returns. And so learn how to properly raise the children of the millennium. Right? It's going to be our responsibility. They must be sanctified and consecrated, meaning set apart for a specific purpose, a holy purpose. Revelation 19.9 9 says, And the angel said to me, Write, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. You can also see Isaiah 30, verse 20. So from, <clears throat> from this fast, we continue on um, our ongoing private preparation for Passover in discerning the body, the church of God, and examining and judging ourselves. In 1 Corinthians 11, 28 through 31, it says, Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment to himself, or on himself. 
That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. We read that earlier. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. As I'm getting older, I have to be careful about this irritable part. <laughs> I'm becoming a grumpy old man, so I have to watch that. So this, this discernment of the body is best accomplished when we all, you know, make a list. All you have to do is write down a list of all of the, your failings, your shortcomings, and maybe list some actions you can take to overcome those shortcomings. And strengthen yourself and our resolve to overcome. And we do this so that we can mature and so that we're not placed under Christ's judgment. 1 Peter 4.17 says, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? So we're being judged now by what we do and say and think. So moving on now, so we move on from the 7th to the 10th day of the first month, which is Sunday, April 14th. This is the day that the lamb was set aside during this Passover season. In Exodus 12, 3, it says, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. The offerings for the feast would have been made prior to this so that selections could have been made by this time, right? You had to bring the offering first before it could be selected. The spiritual principle of our individually being set aside for a specific purpose or made holy should be covered on this day during our preparation for Passover. The lamb for sacrifice was selected on the tenth day and brought into the temple of the high, or by the high priest with shouts of Hosanna in the highest and then critically viewed for the next four days. Right, So they kept an eye on it looking for blemishes. Remember, Christ entered the city gate on the route used by the high priest to take the selected lamb to the temple, you know, fulfilling all of the requirements. But before the high priest had arrived. This call was initiated by his disciples from Mark 11, 9 through 10. And then was raised by the priests and Levites who paused when they saw Jesus, right? They're like, whoa, hold on, what's going on here? Although everyone else continued the praise as required by Psalm 8.2 and Matthew 21.16. Christ entered before the high priest came in that year, riding on a colt as prophecy required from Zechariah 9.9. If accepted or sanctified, it was sacrificed as the Passover lamb at the ninth hour or 3 p.m. This was done for the consecration of a new priesthood in that year, specifically for consecration of a new priesthood of the order of Melchizedek with Christ's sacrifice, removing the authority of the Pharisaical priesthood. Christ was accepted by his father, and even if not by the Cohens who wanted a lamb that they had selected, Right? So they didn't accept him, but our, our Father in Heaven did. So moving on now, 
we go to the 14th day of the first month, which is to be observed on Wednesday after dark on April 17th. And this is the Lord's Supper. After 13 days of spiritual preparation, on the 14th day after dark, right? So the dark portion of the 14th, which is the evening at dark on the 17th this year, it's the Lord's Supper. Now, we should at this point be correctly prepared to take this sacrificial offering so that we're not held to account and judged lacking, right? We, we should not be coming to this unprepared and taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. In 1 Corinthians 11, 20 through 27, It says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that... The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the blood or the body and blood of the Lord. Uh, first, there is a foot washing service, right, as this formal ceremony of the Lord's Supper. John 3, 1 through 17 John 3, 1 through 17 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my head, my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. 
So this is a necessary annual re-cleansing as a renewal of baptism. This cleansing requires that we all play a part in the process. And you can see uh, from the scriptures we just read that your feet can be washed by Jesus Christ and you still can be unclean, i.e. Judas Iscariot. 1 Peter 3.21 says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Obtaining this clean mind or way of thinking is done before the taking of the symbolical body and blood of Jesus Christ. We have to go through that process. And, and of course, um, we can only use bread or unleavened bread at this service, right? Because you're at the, the feast accommodations and no leavened bread can be given with sacrifice. In Exodus 23, 18, it says, You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened, or let the fat of my feast remain until the morning. Right? And we know that Christ is the bread that came down from heaven that we partake of so that we don't die. Exodus 34, 25 says, You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened, or let the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover remain until the morning. This is an annual commanded memorial, which may only be held at night, and only on the night he was betrayed, which, uh, which is after dark on the 14th of the first month. This is an, a, a required outward expression of the inner digestion of the truth of the words of the one true God, right? It's, it's the integration of the character of God into our character. Deuteronomy 8.3, And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone. But man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of Yehovah. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, it says, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So whatever trials we go through can't be compared to the glory that we will receive. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal or ageless, age abiding. Only converted, baptized adults may attend the Lord's Supper service. The children are sanctified in the elect, and the elect are sanctified by God our Father. In 1 Corinthians 6, 11, it says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, and, the Spirit of, and by the Spirit of our God. And in 1 Corinthians 7, 14, it says, For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. And in Hebrews 10, 29, it says, How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? They are preserved and kept by Jesus Christ, who is that acceptable sacrifice. Jude chapter 1 verse 1 says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those 
who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews 10.10 10, it says, And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of our God and the power through which he works. And through the name of Jesus Christ, the elect are washed by his sacrifice, continuing in the faith through Yahweh by his Spirit. It is the Spirit of God who works in us to do anything good, so that none can boast that we did it. Without that Spirit working in us to do good, we could do no good. And you see that evidenced when you look around. Acts 26.18 says to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So at the ninth hour or 3 p.m. on Thursday, April 18th, we hold a service. It's called the Death of the Lamb uh, service. And this is the time that the acceptable Lamb of God was sacrificed. In Exodus 12, 6, it says, And it shall be kept by you till the 14th of this month, and all the multitude of the congregation of the children of Israel shall kill it toward evening. Um, in Deuteronomy 16, 6, it says, But at the place which Jehovah your Elohim shall choose to cause his name to dwell in, there you shall sacrifice the Passover, offering at even, at the going down of the sun, at the season of that thou came uh, out of Egypt. So in the, in the afternoon at 3 p.m., we hold this Death of the Lamb service. Um, and our offerings, and, and all of that should be done prior to arriving at the feast. And there are... There are offerings during the feasts, right? Deuteronomy 16, 16, three times a year, right? Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before Yehovah, your Elohim, at the place that he will choose, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booths. They shall not appear before Yehovah empty-handed. Now, we should be putting our offerings in now, in preparation for this feast. Right? So there are only three offerings a year at these three pilgrimage feasts. It should be handed in before the morning of the first day of unleavened bread. It can be handed in earlier, and I suggest that you do. Uh, since it isn't, there's no such thing as a holy day offering, it's a feast offering, right? And uh, Many of these offerings were actually handed in before the 10th day so that the selection of the lamb could be made on the 10th day and set aside. And this fat of the feast, right, that is mentioned in Exodus 23, 18 and 34, 25, is also a reference to the bounty uh, and to your offerings that... Uh, are given at the feast. And as we prepare, right, our rented facilities, we should make sure that all of the leavening products are removed. There's no leaven there. There's no uh, satanic, satanic uh, symbolism or icons, no pagan symbols, that kind of stuff should be removed. You know, in Exodus 12, 15, it says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened, from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. So you have to deleaven the accommodations. You deleaven um, 
you know where you're at and deleven your home before you leave and uh, you make sure that everything is right at the facility where you'll be keeping the days of unleavened bread and if you miss the first Passover Lord's Supper Passover you can keep it again in the second month or keep it the second month because you missed it the first month right and in this case in this year 2019 it's on May 17th and 18th and those are the 14th and 15th days of the second month this year and this is a, a salvation issue the Lord's Supper is a, a salvation event. We have to keep it. If you're baptized. Numbers 9, 9 through 11 says, Yehovah spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the people of Israel saying, If any one of you or of your descendants is unclean through touching a dead body or is on a long journey, he shall still keep the Passover to Yehovah. In the second month of the 14th day, or on the 14th day at twilight, each, they shall keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Right? So they keep it just as they did in the first month. And that's how critical it is. So that if for whatever reason you're not able to keep it in the first month, you get another chance to keep it in the second month. So now we move on to the... 15th day um, of the month, which is uh, the Passover meal, right? And this meal is observed on the night portion of Thursday, the 18th. So after dark, uh, we observe this Passover or Seder meal. Now the meat is from a clean ruminant animal, usually a lamb. Um, it's slow roasted or barbecued and completely eaten. We typically eat lamb without the bone. Um, there's no, bear in mind that this is not an animal sacrifice. We're eating the lamb as a symbol of the lamb that was sacrificed. Exodus 12, 6 through 11 says, And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, <clears throat> roast it on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it, its head and its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is Yehovah's Passover. So, so this at dark, right, becomes the first day of unleavened bread as, you know, because you're keeping it at, after dark on the 14th, which happens to be the 18th of, of April this year. And then that when it's dark becomes the 15th, um, but isn't reckoned as the 19th of April until midnight, which is crazy, but so, so at dark on the 18th, it starts the uh, first day of unleavened bread, which is the 15th day. And according to Leviticus 23, 6, it says on the 15th day of the same month in the feast of unleavened bread, or is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to Yehovah, for seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And this even, evening observance is also referred to as the night to be much observed, or greatly remembered, and also as the night of watching. 
and this terminology should be studied and, and understood, right? In Exodus 12, 42, it says, It was a night of watching by Yehovah to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to Yehovah by all the people of Israel throughout their generation. And in Exodus 13, 3, it says, Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand, Yehovah brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. So, you know, we have the meal, and at the end of the meal, um, the youngest child that's, you know, able to, or one of the unconverted members, when I say unconverted, I mean not, not baptized, or one of the newest members or youngest members, uh, should ask a question, why are we doing this, right? Because, you know, over in Exodus 12, 26, it says, And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? Right? So there's this question. Exodus 13, 14 says, And when in time to come your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, By a strong hand, Yehovah brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. So the meaning of Passover and its symbols of wine, lamb, unleavened bread, bitter herbs, and the use of salt are explained throughout uh, the evening after dinner. Uh, drink offerings of wine occurred with many of the sacrifices. In the future, we see that the morning sacrifices will be instituted again in Ezekiel 46. In the millennial period, we'll see the morning sacrifices reinstituted. Uh, and because the drink offerings, um, which is the wine, which represents the blood, have been fulfilled, they are absent from the other aspects of these future offerings. So that part of the offering is not reinstituted. And there is a paper called Passover Questions and Reasons for Our Faith that um, you can use as a guide uh, for those questions um, during, you know, after the, the meal. So we all eat of the lamb or meat of the herd and prepare it by roasting without the bone. Uh, in Egypt, leftover meat and the unbroken bone was to be burnt so their priests could not use it for sacrifice. In Exodus 12, 10, it says, And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning sh you shall burn. This complete burning or holocaust was done so that this sacrifice, which protected the sanctified firstborn of Israel, could not be collected and offered to a false god by the false priests of Egypt. The meal itself is a physical representation of the spiritual declaration that our Father will reconcile all of his creation. And during the remainder of the week, morning services will be held, right? We'll have morning services during the feast and studies and, and with discussion should continue, right? And typically when we're all together, we sit around, you know, and have all kinds of interesting conversation and debate. And that's why, you know, we're told not to forsake the assembling together of ourselves. Unfortunately, due to distance, sometimes we are not able to do that. So, uh, we do the best we can. So now we move over to uh, the wave sheaf, uh, which is on Sunday, April 21st. And there will be a 9 a.m. service. Um, and we'll be scheduling all of these services on WebEx so that everybody can attend. In, Levit in Leviticus 23, 10 through 12, it says, Speak to the, children, the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priests, and he shall wave the sheaf before Yehovah so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it, and on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb 
a year old without blemish, as a burnt offering to Yehovah. Leviticus 14.12 says, And a priest shall take one of the male lambs and offer it for a guilt offering, along with the log of oil, and wave them for a wave offering before Yehovah. It is symbolic of the first of the first fruits, which were 2 to 3 percent of the annual offering. Right? Exodus 34, 26 says, The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of Yehovah your Elohim. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, it says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Right? So Christ is the first fruits. Hebrews 7, 11 through 17. So now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there be or would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one uh, whom these things are spoken belonged, sorry, for when there's, a, for, for the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So new spiritual food, metaphorically speaking, may be eaten, meaning better understood, mentally digested, from this point forward. As I said, we hold a service at 9 a.m., the wave sheaf offering itself is not a holy day um, as it falls on Sunday and is not on the seventh day of unleavened bread. This day and time sets the timing and the count for Pentecost, which will be held on um, 50 days, right? The day after the seventh Sabbath from this point forward and that is also held at nine o'clock and you know this d day and time points to the church of God or the assemblies of Eloah or whoever the followers of the one true God are uh, because they are the first fruits of the second grain harvest in Exodus 34, 22, you shall observe the Feast of Weeks, the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering at the year's end. Right? In 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23, it says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive but each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. We can see that Jesus Christ is the first of the firstfruits of the first resurrection, right? Those who are the living stones of the living temple of God and who are the firstfruits of God's redemption. That's us, the wheat harvest, the first harvest. James chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. And in Revelation 14, 4, it says, If these who have not defiled themselves with women, sorry, it is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins, 
It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as firstfruits for God and the Lamb. So that brings us now to the 21st day, which happens to be on April 25th, which is the last day of unleavened bread. And it is a holy day. Right? Leviticus 23.8, But you shall present a food offering to Yehovah for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. Deuteronomy 16.8, for six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a solemn assembly to Yehovah your Elohim. You shall do no work on it. Again, we will have holy day services that day. Uh, most of the time we have two services on these holy days, one at nine or ten and one at three. And uh, it co coincides with the timing of the physical sacrifices. Right? Exodus 29, 39 says, One lamb you shall offer in the morning, the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. So this covers the times of the morning and afternoon sacrifices, as I said, uh, which were held at 9 and 3, or the 3rd and ninth hours of every day. Very few people, brethren, really commit themselves to completely observing this 21-day period of sanctification. And when you read in Daniel, right, Daniel 10, verses 1 through 13, it says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar, and the word was true, and it was a great conflict and he understood the word and had understanding of the vision in those days I Daniel was mourning for three weeks it just so happens to be 21 days I ate no delicacies no meat or wine entered my mouth nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks on the 24th day of the first month as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is, the Tigris. I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep, with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and, and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when I, he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, so the 21 days, right? Your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. So as you can see from that passage in Scripture, this is discuss, discussing the 21 days of the first month of the year. Now, many or even, dare say, most of the people around us would mock and scorn 
those who observe these 21 days and truly commit themselves to serve their Creator wholeheartedly. Now, over time, most people, if they're obeying these, these commands, will be able to discern it. They'll be able to understand it. Now, there is uh, these, the, you can read um, in Scripture talking about Jeroboam in the, in the separated ten tribes. Um, it's in the full paper, uh, but I didn't include it in this uh, abridged version. But under Jeroboam, those northern ten tribes refused to keep the feasts at Jerusalem, but kept and still keep the feast on Mount Gerizim, Gerizim using a different calendar and start of the year. Right? So they, they didn't keep it when they were supposed to. The second month was their first month under Jeroboam, and initially they kept it in Jerusalem before they were removed from the Promised Land. The second Passover um, this year, as I said, is uh, May, uh, what is it, May 18th and 19th. I have to double check that. I, I mean, look. Well, we'll be publishing it anyway, but I, I think it was on the 18th and 19th. Um, but even in error, right, all may be saved from a penalty by the prayer of a righteous individual, right? The righteous prayers can accomplish a lot. Second Chronicles 30, 18 through 20 says, For a majority of the people, many of them from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves. Yet they ate the Passover otherwise than as prescribed. So they, they ate the Passover in an unworthy manner, in a way that they weren't supposed to. For Hezekiah had prayed for them, saying, May the good Yehovah pardon everyone who sets his heart to seek Elohim, Yehovah, the Elohim of his fathers, even though not according to the sanctuary's rules of cleanness, and Yehovah heard Hezekiah and healed the people. That's pretty amazing. James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So, brethren... We try to fulfill the terms presented here and remove all idolatry from our lives. And, and we, idolatry can be as simple as presuming that we're more important than others, which can end with you believing that you or your affiliation or your organization or membership hold the gateway or control the gateway to the kingdom of God. Humanity's idolatry, putting ourselves on God's throne, is responsible for most of the curses upon us and on all of creation. It's reaching a point where a severe penalty is coming and will be cleansing the earth. This occurred in the flood, but will happen this time by fire from Ezekiel 37, 23 and Ezekiel 14, 1 through 23. There is no curse that comes into effect without a granting of time and opportunity for repentance, right? He warns us, gives us an opportunity to repent before it happens. Now, this is even if we, uh, you know, have been provoked uh, by lies to an unrighteous response. We have to control our own thinking and therefore control ourselves. 
2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And then in Proverbs 26.2, it says, Like a sparrow in its flitting, like a swallow in its flying, a curse that is causeless does not alight. Idolatry will increase the lack of comprehension of who our true Heavenly Father is. Satan believed he was, Isaiah 45, 5 through 25. So we should understand what an idol is and what mindset will produce our service to it and so receive that corrective judgment, right? Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 31 through 44. There are three fundamental requirements to obtain eternal life in the first resurrection, and they need to be understood. We must understand who, when, and how we are to worship at this, uh, as this understanding relates to our belief, our faith, and our obedience. We have to properly understand who God is, who Christ is, who it is we worship, because those are the foundations of our belief and our faith and our obedience. We must believe and know that there is one true God alone, from Deuteronomy 6.4, Malachi 2.10, Ephesians 4.6. And we must also know Yahushua, Jesus the Christ, whom he has sent, from John 17.3, 1 Timothy 2.5, and 1 Corinthians 8.4-6. We must have faith in Jesus Christ through knowledge of the one true God from John 17, 3. And this faith and knowledge leads to our baptism for our receipt of the gift of the Holy Spirit from our faith that Yehovah raised him from the dead, from Romans 10, 9. And that is a salvation belief. We must obey and participate in the Lord's Supper with the annual re-cleansing, foot washing, and symbolic eating of the body and drinking of the blood of Jesus Christ from John 6, 53-58 and 1 Corinthians 6, 11. These are the prerequisites for the retention of the Holy Spirit. See, they, this, this fallacy of the once saved, always saved is just that. It's a fallacy. There are, there are prerequisites for us to retain our salvation. Acts 5.32 says, And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Without God's Spirit, we can't enter into the kingdom of God, and so have eternal life in the first resurrection. Romans 8, verse 11 says, If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit, or through His Spirit, who dwells in you. And Ezekiel 37, 12 through 14. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says Adonai Yehovi, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am Yehovah when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am Yehovah. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares Yehovah. The Holy Spirit is how we worship God. From John 4, 23 through 24, which says, But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. We don't get to choose how we worship our God. He proscribed a method of worship for us, and that is what we are to obey. Many of us were taught our entire lives a complete falsehood of how to worship God. And we have to overcome those because we see what's happened through the corruption of what we call Christianity today 
as converts came into the church, they brought these preconceived notions with them, and they started to permeate like a little piece of leaven permeated the whole loaf, and the next thing you know, the church went off into apostasy. Philippians 3.3 3 says, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Your salvation is between you and our Father, not between you and some other man who has some claimed relationship with our Father. With the receipt of God's Holy Spirit, we will obey all of the commandments of God in the Spirit. Because it is His Spirit that works in us to do good. 1 John 3, 24, Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God and God in Him. And by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. Continually becoming re-cleansed. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, and 8. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. We will keep the testimony of Jesus Christ. From Revelation 12, 17. It says, Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. The dragon is furious with those that keep the commandments of God. Revelation 19.10 says, Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. If we don't take part in the 14th day ceremonial observance with the correct understanding, then we'll have no part with Jesus Christ. John 13, 8 says, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And we read this earlier. Jesus answered him and said, well, if I don't watch you, you have no part with me. We must all discern the body of Christ, as well as our own, and with preparation take the symbolic body and blood as is required for our eternal or inherent life. John 6, 54 says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood as eternal life, I will raise him up on the last day. And we must ensure that we're worshiping the one true God on the days that he set aside and not on the days of our choosing. We have to worship him in the ways that he has prescribed and not in our own ways. We don't get to pick and choose how we worship God. That was handed to us. Man's redemption is tied to both his spiritual life and how he accommodates this with the present social order. Right? And it's, it's becoming more and more difficult to navigate that. The whole of creation, that is the physical Adamic creation, and the beings of the spirit world, or, or first creation, will finally all be redeemed. You can see that in Romans 8, 19 through 13, or 19 through 39, sorry. Uh, also in 2 Peter 3, 9, where it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That is God's will, that all should be saved, and that none should perish. Our comprehension and understanding will increase. Our thoughts will be established by Yehovah, as we correctly obey this complete ordinance. Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit your works unto Yehovah, and your thoughts will be established, confirmed. Brethren, our peace of mind will increase over time, as we continue to keep these days, keep these symbols properly. And we do this because we love 
our Father in heaven, who is the one true God, Yehovah. We're, we should be keeping all of his instructions without any modifications by us, right? No additions, no deletions. No matter what man might try to do to stop us from doing that. So brethren, we're heading into Passover very quickly. Next week, we'll all be heading to where we're going to be keeping the feasts. I pray that Yehovah will bless all of us during our journey and will bless us during the feast uh, with more and deeper understanding of his ways. So brethren, with that, we will close this formal service. Um, and we'll now have our... Our final hymn. If you'll please stand for our closing hymn, turn to page 65 in your hymnal. On page 65 of the hymnal, we will sing a hymn that comes from Psalm 84 titled, How Lovely Are Thy Dwellings. That's page 65, How Lovely Are Thy Dwellings, after which I would like to ask Jerry if he would please close in prayer. So page 65, How Lovely Are Thy Dwellings. Okay, if you'll please remain standing for the opening prayer, we'll, or the closing prayer, sorry. We'll now turn the mic over to Jerry. Jerry, over to you. Uh, did you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Our Father, Jehovah of hosts, we have come before you this day, the Sabbath day that thou hast set aside for us to meet with you to give you the greatest thanks and appreciation. I thank you for all thou hast done and for the understanding that thou hast given to us. That we are to keep thy 21 days of sanctification and to confess our sins before thee and to prepare for the Feast of Unleavened Bread and for the Lord's Supper. We ask, Father, that thou would give us and guide us safety to our destination where we are to meet watch over thy servants father and bless their feast and keep us that we honor thee 
and give you the greatest blessing and appreciation and thanks. And we ask, Father, that thou will heal thy servants of any unnecessary pain or sickness. And may thy servants and their families abide in the shadow of thee. We give you the greatest thanks and appreciation, Father, in the name of thy beloved Son, Yahushua the Christ, for all thou hast done and given to us. Amen.